holistic urban ministry, an accidental church planter, and a flying missionary. All that and more coming up right here on Mission 360. Hello, I'm Gary Krauss and welcome to Mission 360. Today we travel to Peru to meet an Adventist woman who didn't plan on planting a church. She just wanted people to worship with on Sabbath. And we'll talk with Dr. Gaspar Colon about urban mission. What makes it such a challenge and what can we do about it? Also, when people picture a missionary, they might think of a preacher or a teacher, maybe a doctor, a nurse or a dentist. In reality, there are hundreds of types of missionaries. Some are builders, some are librarians, there are accountants, engineers, bakers, translators, or even computer and media specialists. Today, we'll travel to Indonesia to meet a missionary pilot who was called to fly. And after that, we'll talk with Adventist Mission video producer, Ricky Oliveris, who documented this high altitude mission story. My name is Bob Roberts, and my job is mission pilot. Bob Roberts lives and works in Papua, Indonesia. He's been flying with Adventist Aviation Services in Indonesia for more than 20 years. He's seen all kinds of things and met thousands of people hungry to learn about Jesus. On a typical morning, Bob gets up, checks to make sure everything is okay with the plane, and climbs in for a ride. He delivers supplies, visits villages, and transports people throughout the many islands of this region. If you look on the map, you'll see that the island is split in half. The eastern side is the country of Papua New Guinea, while the western half is part of Indonesia. Here in Papua, there are huge mission challenges. The first obstacle is getting to the people. The terrain here is extremely rough. Mountains, rivers, and dense jungle make it nearly impossible to walk through. To reach some of these villages by foot, it can take weeks of hiking and chopping through this terrain. That's where Adventist Aviation Services comes to the rescue. Trips that used to take weeks now take hours, thanks to Bob's flying. These islands contain more than 500 language groups, you can imagine how difficult it is to reach so many languages in an area made up of hundreds of islands. Almost 90% of these people have never even heard the gospel. Bob flies to reach the unreached. He has been flying for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for almost 40 years now. He spent a number of years flying in Africa before coming to Indonesia. His experience in the air is extremely valuable to the mission work in Indonesia. This is where he feels at home and where God has called him to fly. When visiting this small city in West Papua, Bob discovered that the local Adventist pastor's father was very sick and had no way to see him. If he took a boat to visit his father, it could take days. The pastor was very disappointed that he may never see his father again. Bob offered to fly him to the nearby city to visit his father. With the services of the Adventist Aviation Plane, the pastor was able to see his father again and share encouraging words with him. Bob often transports sick people to get medical attention. Many of the small cities and villages have no medical facilities. Commercial planes rarely or never fly some places. Even with small commercial planes, it is very expensive for a villager to afford a ticket. We fly a lot of sick people and uh, when we do fly sick people, we fly them for free if they're really sick. Bob's flying is a ministry. He cares about the people he visits. He wants to bring the message and hope of Jesus to the people of Indonesia. So those are the kind of things that make you glad you're a mission pilot, helping people that would not have a hope otherwise. And uh, that's why we're here. 
Please pray for Bob as he continues to fly for Jesus. Pray for the hundreds of workers around the world who've left the comforts of home to serve. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My guest is Ricky Oliveris, who is a video producer for the Office of Adventist Mission. And Ricky is also the person who put together the video that we just watched. Ricky, I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. Uh, what an amazing opportunity to be making a video in a place like that. Yeah, it was a beautiful place, you know, gorgeous land. Um, the water was crystal clear in most places and the people were friendly, so I couldn't have asked for more. Now, this is Indonesia, but it's not the Indonesia we normally think of. Right. Uh, this is Irian Jaya, which is... Well, on the other half of that island is the is Papua New Guinea. Right. Now, these places you get are obviously fairly inaccessible. T tell us about transportation there. Yeah, transportation is probably one of the biggest challenges of that area. Um, in order to get to some of these places, you need to either take a boat for days to get from one island to another, because this is a region made up of thousands of islands. And then you'd have to hike in or drive in or Sometimes you can't even drive in. You'd have to hike for weeks to get places. Mm. And so um, I spent my time with Bob Roberts, who's the pilot. And with the mission plane, the Adventist Aviation Services plane, we were, able to, we were able to take trips that took a few hours in the plane and save us weeks of hiking. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was, I mean, it's pretty dense jungle. And, you know, you'd have to cross rivers and all kinds of terrain. Now, Bob is a, a missionary who has been working in Irian Jaya for many years, right? Yeah, he's been working in that region of the world for more than 20 years yeah. now. He's been working for the church for more than 40 years. Uh, he previously worked in Africa and, and the U.S., so he's, he's got a lot of mission experience. <laughs> A lot of flying experience. Which is kind of nice when you're traveling with him to know that he's experienced. <laughs> yeah, it's reassuring. <laughs> now, some of the airports you landed in, tell me about those. Well, you would think some of the airports I took off on, let's say from the U.S., you know, big runways, um, big planes, you feel, like, you, you feel like you're, you know, in a big sh ship, basically, going up into the air. Um, when flying with Bob, the plane is much smaller. <laughs> It's the runways are much smaller. Um, some of the runways that he lands on are made of, you know, just a strip of land. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the privilege of sometimes landing on, you know, a regular paved runway, which was great, which was done in just recently. Um, so that was nice. But it's it's a contrast from what we are used to seeing here. Yeah. Yeah. So what sort of mission work is taking place there? Well, there, there's a lot of church planting, and um, first of all, one of the challenge, another challenge, um, is the, one of, is the terrain. Another challenge is the languages. You know, yes. in this part of the world, there are more than 500 languages. Wow. Not just in Indonesia, but in in this region, East Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, this small region of Indonesia, 500 languages. So imagine trying to reach that many language groups in in that part of the world. You can't just send somebody in to learn all of these languages. Mm -hmm. You have to find somebody who knows the language, mm -hmm. find somebody who knows the culture, who knows the customs, um, and have them go into that part of the world. So that's what, um, that's what the Seventh-day Adventist Church is doing, uh, Global Mission is doing. We're uh, sending people that know this culture, know this culture and know how to reach the people there. Right, so one of the values is you you have people working among their own people because exactly. they're fantastic. Now, when Bob flies from place to place, what is he doing? What is he transporting? What is... Oh, he does all kinds of things, <laughs> but he transports, uh, you know, medical supplies. He transports people often. The people are sick. They need to be uh, emergency evacuated from there. He uh, transports supplies that villages need. He transports Bibles. He, he provides the needs uh, of the, the mission there, whatever it may be, he's, he's very willing. Mm. And <laughs> it, it's hard to box in his job description right. because it's so, it's so wide. Yeah. And uh, he also even does some dental work on the side, okay. believe it or not. W was it helpful? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess he said. I didn't get to witness it, but okay. he's telling me some of the stories. So you also traveled with another missionary. What, yes. Who was he and what is his role? 
Uh, the other missionary was Darren Boyd, and he's been there for about two years now, maybe a little more than two to three years. And he is just working on, you know, training these global mission pioneers and training the people to, to reach um, their villages. And uh, he does a lot of different things also. You know, when you're a missionary, your job description can't be in a box. Right. You have to be flexible and adaptable. So he does a lot of that, but he does a lot of training to, to teach people how to reach um, people in their villages. So uh, tell me a story. What, tell me a story you heard when you were there. So one thing that happened when I was there was we were flying. We flew into an island with Bob. Um, we got out of the plane, unloaded into a car. We drove about an hour into a village named Kramamonga. Try saying that five times. I'm very now. impressed. <laughs> I know. I've practiced. <laughs> um, we, we made it to Kramamonga, and there were two guys outside of our outside of our van and one of them had like a, a bell he rang bee ding ding you know and the other guy put a lay you know like the island culture yeah. they use lays they, of uh, nutmeg flowers that they collected from the jungle so we thought wow this is a really nice welcome so we went into a house that was next to the road and I was surprised when I walked in my eyes opened wide because there were you know 40 50 60 people in this house and I was like whoa what are all these people doing here and I came to find out that they were all Seventh-day Adventists. The whole village was made up of Seventh-day Adventists because the chief of the village had learned about the Adventist message years ago. And he had gone door to door teaching people and pleading with the people wow. um, to, be, to learn and accept the Sabbath. And they had. Huh. And it was pretty amazing to see. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Ricky, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. Thank you. Um, what an amazing opportunity you have to film in those sort of areas. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Our viewers at home, please pray for the work in Iri and Jaya, um, in Indonesia in general. And remember missionaries, people like Bob, who daily risk their lives in service for God. Um, don't go away. We'll be back just a few moments after this short break. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest is Dr. Gaspar Colon from Washington Adventist University. For many years, he has also been the director of the Center for Metropolitan Ministry, and he has had for many years a passion for holistic urban mission. Thank you so much, Gaspar, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, your first experience in urban mission goes back some 40 years when you and your soon-to-be wife were ministering in New York City. Um, last time I was talking with you, you talked about how you started trying to attract people to a certain center, but it wasn't working. Keep, keep telling me about what you did there. Well, um, we, we had a, a building in the theater district of New York City um, in Manhattan, and, um, but people in the community itself, in the residential community, which was only a block and a half away uh, from this center, uh, just wouldn't come, mm. basically, because they, th it was not a place that had anything to do with their daily life. And so as we sought to get acquainted with people in the community, we did uh, some uh, uh, education, health education in the schools, got acquainted with the kids in the community. And then we, we rented a, a storefront it wasn't very wide. It's one of these uh, 12 feet wide and 30 feet deep mm -hmm. uh, type of storefronts next to a Chinese laundry and a church that had been converted into a discotheque. And, um, and we decided that we would put carpeting down, get some nice tables in there and have crafts for the kids and do maybe start a Pathfinder club with the children who we have, had met. But we had to put up a sign. And back then, uh, bubble letters were really, <laughs> <laughs> really in. And so we got we got 12-inch styrofoam, and we had just drawn the letters for the open door. Huh. And that that center was going to be called the open door. We decided that uh, instead of messing up the carpet inside the uh, the 
storefront, that we would go down the street to a playground. Now, this playground is not like the playgrounds that we see today. It just had two basketball hoops, and uh, it was uh, an empty spot where a building used to be and had been paved over and had a big fence in front of it. And um, we started carving our letters, and the young man who was playing basketball comes over. Uh, he sees what we're doing. He says, uh, hey, uh, what you doing there? And uh, we said, well, we're carving some, some letters for a sign for our community center that we're starting down the street. And uh, he says, well, uh, can I help? Hmm. And so he decided to help. And then some of his friends came. And pretty soon, we were just supervising all these kids who had played basketball there and, um, and were just uh, uh, hanging around. Pretty soon, this was their center. They were putting up the sign for it. Mm. And I would get up on the ladder, and they'd be across the street, and they'd be saying a little bit to the left <laughs> and stuff. And um, within a matter of a month, the place was thriving with people from the community. As we visited people in their homes, we found out that because it was summertime, it was so hot that at about nine o'clock at night, people would go out onto their stoop and they would sit there and, and the children would run back and forth. And so our visitation hours were from nine to 9 p.m. to about 2 a.m. Oh. And we would give Bible studies or we'd get better acquainted with people in the community. And uh, it, was, it was really, a, an exercise in learning how to become part of a community mm -hmm. rather than always being looking like you just are trying to break into the community from the outside. That's a very important principle. It is. It, uh, is. it sounds very much like the incarnation to me with <laughs> Jesus. Right, exactly. <laughs> Now, Dr. Colon, you, you have also been involved in the Center for Metropolitan Ministry, and one of the things that you emphasize is the importance of understanding the community. Tell That's me right. about that. Well, you know, we really will always be outsiders trying to break into the community until we decide to go out and talk to the gatekeepers in the community, talk to the individuals who have who have authority and who contribute to the well-being of the community and ask them, tell them we're willing to, to help, but what do you consider to be the most important things and, and where could a, a group like us begin? And as we start talking to them, about specifics within the community, we get ideas of how we can be contextualized into their leadership of the community itself. So then they are inviting us because we have shared an interest in doing what they want to do in the community. Mm. That's, that's basically the first step. Diag well, physicians, do it all the time. Diagnose right. before you treat. Right. And uh, if, you know, we have a great gospel message, but unless it comes in a way that, that people feel is going to make their life easier or better to live, um, we will always be pushing ourselves on other people. Mm. That, yeah. And then there, there are other things that we, we talk about, uh, doing a visual assessment of the community, looking at the, at the foot traffic, um, doing surveys uh, of, of people, of how they feel and, and what they're doing. And uh, as, as you progress deeper and deeper into the community, the partnerships that you create with other agencies in the community are very, very important. Fantastic. Gaspar, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, viewers at home, uh, very important principle, Jesus method. You mingle first, you show sympathy, you minister to needs, and you first of all have to understand the community. Thank you for reminding us of that important principle. For more information on Mission to the Cities, go to missiontothecities.org. Simply missiontothecities.org. Lots of information there. 
From the streets of New York City, we now go to the country of Peru. Along the coast of Peru lies the town of Huanchaco, once a small beach town with no Seventh-day Adventist community. Huanchaco is now home to a growing congregation. When Eva Sanchez moved here, she longed for a church community. Since the closest Seventh-day Adventist church was more than a 30-minute bus ride away, Eva took it upon herself to be a witness in her own town. Eva found a small, humble building to have meetings in and invited the whole community to attend. After seeing the effectiveness of the meetings, Eva realized the great need for a church within this community. Si se interesa. Amén. Muy bien. A ver qué nos dice la Biblia. En tercera de Juan, versículo 2. Amado, yo deseo que tú seas prosperado en todas las cosas. With a growing interest from the people in Huanchaco, Eva is still reaching out to those searching for the light of Jesus. Sometimes she walks great distances to visit people in their homes and develops lasting relationships with those she reaches out to. Her efforts have had great impact on her community. Dios que trabaja en los corazones de las personas. Le agradezco tanto también que se, se un hermanito joven que vino a avisarme. Por gratitud. I share the gospel because I'm thankful to God, because Jesus touched my heart, and I really feel the power of Jesus. I want to continue to share the gospel. Eva has finally found the church community she longed for when she moved to Wanchaco. As the numbers in this congregation continue to grow, their church building remains the same size. They are hoping to expand their building to fit the needs of the congregation. The needs for this church and many others around the world are great. Please pray for the faithful members in Huanchaco that they may continue to grow and be a light to their community. And thank you for your support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our 360 degree view of mission around the world on today's program. From the coast of Peru to the highlands of Indonesia, from teeming cities to remote villages, people are sharing the light of Jesus' love. So please pray for the people and places you see here and for the many frontline global mission workers around the globe. And thank you so much for your continuing financial support of mission that helps make so much of this possible. As we close, Let's add one more stop to our worldwide mission tour and visit the continent of Africa to hear a prison choir sing. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.
Wapate kuwa kolewa 